Today's guest on the Keenan Yoga podcast is Dr. Jason Birch. We can't say how excited and pleased we are to have Dr. Birch today with us. Um, his groundbreaking work on the Amanaska, an early 17th century text previously overlooked, has reshaped our understanding of the origins of the term Hatha Yoga, and locating it, in fact, within the Buddhist literature framework. So Jason was a senior research fellow for the Light on Hatha Yoga project one hosted at SOAS University between 2015 and 2020, which received incredible acclaim, along with James Mallerton, Mark Singleton, and Daniela Bibalacqua, and tracing the roots of modern postural yoga, uh, a project that famously ended with what they have termed embodied philology, uh, which was the performance of the yoga postures in the ancient texts as they were written down, as they were described, uh, by modern-day um, Ashtanga, actually, practitioners. So an, in, an incredible project and um, has been remarkably influential in the current discussion of Hatha Yoga and what we're doing. Um, Jason is a yoga practitioner as well as a yoga scholar with a specific interest in the medieval period over which Hatha Yoga can be seen to really develop textually. As well as this, his, in his other area of speciality, he's written important papers on the relationship between Raja Yoga and Hatha Yoga. And having identified the earliest text to teach a system of Hatha and Raja Yoga, namely the 12th century Amaraga. I think I said that right, but maybe not. <laughs> Jason is a founding member of the Centre of Yoga Studies at SOAS and the Journal of Yoga Studies and combines his practical experience of yoga with academic knowledge of its history to teach online courses with Jacqueline Hargreaves, his wife, over his website, The Luminescent, and to engage in uh, many of these projects with uh, as he's just done uh, with the light on the happy yoga project and he's embarking on a new one now currently i believe so it's an honor to have jason with us today as one of the foremost scholars of the modern yoga tradition and its evolution from classical roots um welcome jason without further ado to the kenyan yoga podcast it's fantastic to have you here So welcome Jason Birch to um, Keenan Yoga. I don't know what to call this. It'll probably be a podcast and it's a YouTube chat. Um, Jason is a senior research uh, fellow. I think you call it a fellow. It's an old fashioned English word for um, a researcher, I suppose, or a professor at uh, SOAS. SOAS is the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, UK. And uh, he's also got a, he's currently working on a light on Hatha project, which is about the yoga Pradipika particularly the Yoga Pradipika of Swatmarama, I think. Um, and that, I don't know how, lo how long that's in completion or when, the, when you'll get the results of that. Uh, in another year and a half, it uh, finishes. Yeah, so it's been going for a year and a half. It started at the beginning of 2020, uh, 2021, sorry. Uh, and it will finish uh, at the end of next year. It sounds like a lot of, um, a lot of work and a lot of writing and reading and uh, editing. <laughs> It is because yeah. we've we've uh, accessed so many manuscripts of the Hatha Pradipika. So the text itself is not that long. It's uh, maybe four to five hundred ver verses, depending on the version that you're that you're looking at. Uh, but there's over two hundred manuscripts uh, in Indian libraries, uh, as well as libraries in Europe and other parts of South Asia. Um, so we've we spent the first year accessing as many of those as we could remotely because uh, travel wasn't uh, wasn't possible uh, in 2021 and uh, we were surprised to to sort of um, to get hold of 150 or so manuscripts which we've looked at um, to date so much of our time has actually gone into trying to work out how to, how to deal with so much manuscript material because you can't, um, well, for practical reasons, it's just too much labor to try and collate uh, so much manuscript material. And the other consideration is that it's, it's, um, it's not helpful in many instances to uh, collate so much material because it will produce uh, a critical edition with, with far too much 
uh, unimportant information in it. Um, so the important information will get lost or be will be very hard for the reader to see. So a lot of our discussion and uh, and and work so far has has focused on how to identify the most important witnesses so that we can sort of out of the 150 manuscripts that we have say oh well these are the 20 or 30 that are most important for uh, establishing the text um, uh, and, and then of course uh, translating it uh, after that and we've sort of um, decided on a on a method for doing that we, we, we've 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 uh, I think done the hard work and we re we've identified nine versions of the text um, and a few of those versions are not so important and in in fact it, it just so happens that the version of the text that most people are familiar with today through the printed editions is based on a rather recent commentary uh, the the Jyotsnya by Brahmananda and he lived in the 19th century and it seemed that uh, when uh, various scholars and publishing houses, various pundits in the late 19th, early 20th century decided to print a copy of the Hatha Pradipika that they, uh, that they used um, his version of the text but be basically because they also used his commentary to understand it and it, and it is a fairly elementary level commentary. It glosses a lot of the words, it explains the basics. So it was useful, I imagine, for pundits and publishers who were not necessarily familiar with um, uh, the literature on Hatha Yoga. But the thing is, of course, he's, he's writing, Brahmananda's writing in the 19th century, uh, and he had a particular agenda behind his commentary. He was sort of trying to interpret the text from a more from a more Vedantic point of view. So he uh, chose a version of the text that was suitable for that and and perhaps even made some decisions about which verses to include and exclude. So when we go back to older manuscripts, we see uh, in, in in a lot of cases uh, different structure. I mean the basic structure of the text is four chapters. The first is on asana, the second pranayama with the shat karma as a as a type of um, preliminary practice to the kumbhakas, the um, eight kumbhakas that are taught in the second chapter. Mudra is the topic of the third, and then the fourth is on raja yoga. And the overarching structure or scheme is that hatha yoga, the, the, the practice of the first three chapters, is the means to achieving raja yoga, which is the goal uh, of Hatha, and it's basically the practice of samadhi, a profound state of meditation that is necessary for achieving liberation, liberation from uh, worldly existence, suffering, pain, all the sorts of things that we try to uh, try to um, avoid to escape. <laughs> yeah, avoid, um, reduce. Yeah, lessen. yeah, at least lessen, at least lessen. What? So I, I notice in a lot of your work, there's a lot of uh, it's very dense, often in comparative texts, and um, I suppose my original mm. question was, why is that? I mean, it might sound really stupid, but why is that such a focus? And then you kind of answered it in a way by saying, well, there's huge differentiations between the copies of these texts around, right? We, you know, like, mm. so they might be massively, depending on who has got his hands on what, his or her or their hands on what, you know, the, you know, what, what would come across as the Yoga Shastra, Patanjali Shastra or the, um, the Pradipika might, be massively different, right? Is that is that correct? Mm. The, Absolutely. There, there are different versions of the text that uh, that are created over time. In some cases, it's um, it's not particularly deliberate. What what can happen is that uh, marginal notes and comments that someone makes on a manuscript slowly get absorbed into the main text. So someone could be reading the te reading the text. And there could be ver certain verses that are relevant to the material that they're reading that they write in the margin for their own mm. use, their own benefit. And then someone comes along and decides to do a new copy of that manuscript. And then some of the verses that are in the margin that are not always easy to uh, distinguish the main part of the text from the margin, some of those suddenly find their way into the text. And so... Generally speaking, over time, Sanskrit texts with a manuscript transmission start to 
grow in size, they start to get larger. Uh, and people can also deliberately add materials. So if they feel that there's not enough verses on Kirtari Mudra, for example, and they know some really helpful, in, in their opinion, really helpful verses from somewhere else, they just might put them into the text when they're, when they're copying out a manuscript. And then likewise, in, in other cases, some parts of the text uh, get left out or omitted deliberately. So they can be left out just by a scribe whose eye skips from one point to another um, unknowingly, and, and so he, he misses some, some material out. And so you're reading the manuscript, and you, you, if you know the text, you might be sort of going from one verse to another, one page to another, and all of a sudden there's something missing, and you're wondering where it's gone, and it's just because a scribe has, uh, has skipped over it. Uh, and then in other cases, scribes can deliberately omit material if they don't think it's appropriate. And that happened with the uh, Hatha Pradipika in the third chapter on Vadroli Mudra, this uh, mudra that uh, involves um, absorbing semen back up through the urethra, yeah. usually after sexual intercourse. We can't do the whole and podcast with Jim on that. If oh, people, okay. yeah, yes. people want to listen to that. Yeah, we've kind of spoken up for about an hour almost in the end. <laughs> mm. Well, it's a, it's it's a, a it's a an interesting subject. subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And for those who've listened to that podcast, they'll realise that um, you know there were some uh, sort of orthodox groups of um, uh, within Indian society who would have found that material uh, distasteful or un, un uh, uh, you know basically. Uh, uh, would have would have um, gone against their notions of purity and propriety and so forth. So this is probably why the Vadroli section is omitted from some manuscripts. And in fact, we do get a scribal comment uh, saying that the practice was omitted because it was not considered to be a universal practice. And then in other cases, that content on Vadroli was omitted and then added as a fifth chapter to the text, so, sort of like an appendix. So it's it's. So for, for anybody who might be offended by Vadroli Mudra, they just read chapters one to four. And then for anybody who really wants that material, it's, it's, a, it's a separate fifth chapter. So these types of changes to Sanskrit texts happen over the centuries, so much so that sometimes the original version of the text is lost or, or we as readers or editors are are wondering what it was, you know, how, you know, how large was the original text? Was Vadroli in the original text or was it added at a later time? All these are legitimate questions when you start to see different versions of the text um, appearing in different uh, manuscripts. So a critical edition. So if you look at the printed editions that were published at the end of the 19th or early 20th century, you just think there's one version of the text and that's it. It's a sort of a fixed thing. And when you read the translation, you think, well, this is what Svatmarama, the author of the Hatha Pradipika, was writing in the 15th century. This is what, what he intended and how he was thinking. I think what we're trying to do as academics and uh, um, scholars is we're trying to reveal to a wider audience that actually the text has been... Um, many different things to different people. There's been different versions of the text, uh, different readings within the verses, uh, and we really want to produce an edition that has all of that information, relevant information in there, so that a, a really interested reader can go into the edition and see all of the differences uh, and, and, and understand that. Um, so there's that, that's our main aim with a critical edition, is to show the different versions of the text. Now, it's often not easy to do with a printed edition because you're, you're um, restricted by what a book can do. Uh, and this is where digital editions are starting to take over. And for the Light on Hutter project, where we are working to produce a digital edition. And the beauty with digital editions is that you can change the structure of the text. You can present different versions of the text just with the click of a button. And you can also uh, supply a lot of notes and annotations, uh, variant readings and so forth, uh, quite easily without it overwhelming the reader. Because again, with a printed edition, often if you, are, if you try to put all of that information on the page, 
then there might be just sort of one verse at the top of the page and then the rest is just footnotes. Yeah. And for the, yeah. a- for the average reader, footnotes and all of that t- tends ah, to sort of... Yeah, small writing. Yeah, yeah. I found that a little <laughs> bit, I have to say, with Roots of Yoga. It was like there was a lot of footnotes there and, and probably I didn't read half of the book because I just didn't read a lot of the footnotes if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, mean get, uh, get... Sorry, Jess. <laughs> it's, 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 so, it, it, as academics, we love footnotes uh, because uh, it sort of enables us to provide that information that that would otherwise clog up the main part of the text, you know, if we tried to sort of... And, and there, is, there, there has been a sort of a trend within particularly American scholarship to write a book, a scholarly book, without footnotes and include all the information. Mm-hmm. But often what happens then is they end up leaving out a lot of information because it, it, it makes the main part of the text so complicated that nobody, you know, would read that. Whereas if you're working with a sort of main text footnote format, you can strive to keep the main text simple to some extent. Just put the, you know, the basic arguments and information up there. And if somebody sort of reads that and says, well, hang on a minute, what about, you know, the, the, the writers just said Svatmarama lived in the 15th century, but what about um, this, this, uh, this other book that says that he lived in the 17th century? Well, you could address that in a footnote. You could say, you know, the evidence suggests Svatmarama lived in the 15th century because of X, Y, and Z. The proposal that he lived in the 17th century is unfounded because of X, Y, and Z. So you, you can have those sort of, provide that sort of information for the reader who might be wanting, uh, you know, more detail. But for the re- for the for the simpleton, for the one that doesn't, I mean, let's get back maybe now from that. It's super interesting, a uh, land of comparative text and study. And I'm assuming you're reading, I mean, you're kind of reading these ancient texts and trying to figure out what stuff that's kind of like half wilted and half been eaten by ants and, and you're mm. reading the Sanskrit. I mean, it just, it sounds like a crazy kind of project you're involved in. Um, mm. I've got, I actually probably have a lot of other questions with that, but what about the Pradipika then? People are interested in it. Um, you know, our, our listenership is uh, yoga asana based. I mean, is this the first real point when yoga asana is kind of synthesized into a cohesive whole or, and, and um, is it representative of the trends of asana before it, or is it really a kind of change, a sea change in terms of how asana is presented? Uh, it's it's the first instance instance where asana is taught as an anga, an auxiliary of hatha yoga. So one of the one of the reasons that we're able to edit the hatha pradipika now with more confidence than what we could have done in the past is that we've we've through the hatha yoga project we spent a lot of time editing the earlier texts, the texts that Svatmarama, the author of the hatha pradipika, used to create his work. And that's the interesting thing about the Hatha Pradipika. It's a, it's a compendium. It's a sort of anthology. He takes bits and pieces from older material and cut and pastes it into a new format, and if you like, a new four, fourfold structure of Hatha Yoga. And one of those uh, components, one of those elements is asana. Whereas in the earlier text, Asana really just figures more as a seated pose in which pranayama is done and, and, and the mm. emphasis is un, undoubtedly on kumbhaka with the practice of mudra, particularly the bandhas, the three bandhas um, that your, that your um, uh, audience would be familiar with, you know, the mula bandha root lock, udhyana in the uh, abdomen and then the jalandara bandha, the, the chin lock. And these were originally conceived as um, uh, mechanisms which which were used during breath retention. Uh, then, yes, yeah, so that was the emphasis of early Hatha Yoga, these, these uh, mudras. Um, and then what we see in the Hatha Pradipika in the How first How far chapter, back does that go? Sorry. How, when, so, when did that yeah, start so earliest, coming in? Yeah. yeah, the earliest evidence we have is around the 11th, 12th century with the Amrita Siddhi as a, as a text, a Buddhist Badriana work, it doesn't teach Hatha Yoga, but it teaches these uh, uh, bandhas uh, with, with kumbhakas. And then that becomes Hatha Yoga in the, around the 12th century when the material is appropriated by a Shaiva community that produce a text called the Amaralga. Uh, and the Amaralga teaches four types of yoga, uh, mantra, 
Laya, Hatha and Raja Yoga. Raja Yoga is the goal and that's basically just a Shaiva interpretation of Samadhi, you know, uh, meditation. Uh, in fact, it's defined as uh, Chitta Vritti Rahita, which is very similar to Patanjali's definition, Chitta Vritti Niroda, Rahita just meaning without, so without mental activity. Uh, and the uh, the Hatha Yoga is the practice of the um, the the three main mudras, which is Mahamudra, Mahabandha, Mahaveda, uh, and that that results in um, uh, Raja Yoga, basically because it brings about the uh, internal resonance, the nada that the, the yogi can then sort of uh, focus uh, his or her mind on and and reach that profound state of meditation. So that's the sort of that's an early example, and it's a very basic skeletal type of practice, just three mudras in which two of the bandhas are practiced. Uh, and then over time, more techniques are added. So you start to get a repertoire of 10 mudras. Uh, you get uh, start to get four kumbhakas. Kumbhakas are the types of breath retention. Uh, you know, so um, bastra or bastrika, it has the rapid breathing followed by holding the breath. Uh, Ujjayi has the, the sort of rasping sound in the throat, followed by a breath retention with an, with, a, um, uh, with an exhalation through the left nostril. So there's sort of particular ways of holding the breath, and the bandhas are applied during the retention and also at the beginning of the exhalation so that one can extend the exhalation for, uh, uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, and then what we see in the Hatha Pradipika is the you know, the, the, the sort of overarching blueprint for what became known as Hatha Yoga in the early modern period. And that was it, this sort of fourfold system where you have asana, including non-seated asanas. So it's not just the seated postures that we see in earlier texts, such as Siddhasana and Padmasana, but it also includes um, Danyarasana, the bow pose and um, uh, you, you know, there's at least seven non-seated poses: uh, Mayurasana, Matsyendrasana. Right. So um, previous to that, there were no, there's no mention of any kind of yoga postures apart from ones that you were seated to breathe, and uh, well, a kind of Janushishasana, right, where they were doing the Mahamudra stuff, right, like a kind of a roughly kind yes. of extended one leg bend, yeah. one leg straight, you know, kind of like chin in, you know, like uh, bundles engaged, but but nothing other yeah. than that really. No standing stuff, no. Yeah. That's that's true in the context of Hatha Yoga. So in Hatha Yoga, it was pretty much just the mudras, bandhas, and some seated poses. There are examples of earlier yoga systems before the Hatha Pradipika was uh, composed that had Mayurasana and Kukutasana. And these tended to be Vaishnava traditions that date back to around the 9th, 10th century. And uh, they, they have these two poses often in discussions of an Ashtanga type of system. And, uh, you know, amongst asanas, there might be, say, eight or ten asanas that are taught. Um, most of them will be seated asanas, and then Mayurasana and uh, Kukutasana would be, uh, would be included. So the Vasishta Samhita, the Yogi Yajnavalkya, are two good examples of that. And they were source texts for Svatmarama when he produced the Hatha Pradipika, but neither of those texts teach Hatha Yoga. They just teach a Vaishnava version version of Ashtanga. Do they so, say why they were using them? Well, that that's that yes, yeah, so um, there we can speculate. There are there are a few comments around the health benefits of those postures. Even even in the early period, that they're, that they're supposed to cure illnesses. Um, so there, there are some specific comments in the Vasishta Samhita and the Yogi Ajnavalkya that asana um, cures all diseases. And there's a more general comment in an early text called the Viveka Martanda, which, which teaches a six-fold system, a Shadanga Yoga. And there it says asana is for curing illnesses, pranayama for purification, uh, pratyahara for um, uh, for another reason. I think it's for mental disturbances, and and then samadhi, the final auxiliary, the final anga, is for liberation. So, in general statements like that, uh, asana is often referred to in a, you know for curing illnesses, and illnesses are a problem in yoga because yoga relies on practice, abhyasa. 
And if you can't practice because you're sick, then you can't succeed in yoga. So diseases are a problem. And this is why going back to, of course, the time of Patanjali, they're cons considered to be a, an obstacle, um, which I think it's in the first chapter. There are various uh, um, suggested um, uh, practices to, uh, you know, to, to, to overcome them. It's the same in the medieval period to, with, with the asanas and pranayama have lots of um, curative benefits. When we look at the uh, uh, complex asanas in the Hatha Pradipika, such as Matsyendrasana or Mayurasana, there are entire verses devoted to the, to the benefits of those um, post particular postures. And it, the benefits are usually fairly mundane, various diseases, uh, specific diseases, and then you might say more um, exaggerated statements that they, you know, cure a whole group of diseases, yeah. all 20 yeah. kappa everything or everything. diseases or whatever. Yeah, or cure. everything, as in the case yeah. of Padmasana yeah. or yeah. Siddhasana. Yeah. But uh, there's also, um, you know, some yogic types of effects as well, such as raising Kundalini, mm. which is which is one of the benefits of uh, Matsyandrasana. Um, and yeah, so it goes beyond that, uh, beyond beyond just the mundane benefits. But certainly, it seems the emphasis of of um, the complex asanas was to cure illnesses, and that and that, in my opinion, is probably why they were incorporated into systems of of hatha yoga. Um, when we look at earlier texts and their references to um, to asanas, they often mention that there are eighty four luck of asanas, 8,400,000 8, or whatever that works out to be, an enormous number, an innumerable number. Basically, when they say 84 luck, they're saying there's, uh, there's just know, lots, as a many lot of asanas yeah, as, yeah. as there are stars <laughs> in the sky yeah. type of thing. Uh, but then they go on to teach only usually Padmasana or Siddhasana. So in many respects, the, the authors are acknowledging there's, there's you know, countless postures out there, countless asanas, but we really only need these, these, these couple of seated postures. It's with the Hatha Pradipika that that situation changes, that all of a sudden more than just two or three seated poses become important for Hatha Yoga. And then after the Hatha Pradipika, it just grows, mm. where we start to get collections of 32, then... Um, 84, uh, 112, and 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 uh, and that sort of uh, uh, number, S and that that that's that really continues right through to the 20th century. And the reason that we talk about the history of Hatha Yoga and the Hatha Pradipika is because it seems from in that early modern period, from the 16th to the 18th century, that the word Hatha became uh, a you know a dominant paradigm for physical practice. And these other systems that particularly were in existence before the Hatha Pradipika, like the Sharanga system of the Viveka Martanda or the Ashtanga system of the Vas Vashishta Samhita, these tend to, I mean, they still continue. You still get texts written on Sharanga and Ashtanga in the 16th, 17th and 18th century. But in terms of defining physical practice and the use of Complex asanas, the, the the sort of mudras that involve the bandhas, if you like, the word hatha often was often used to describe that type of practice, and uh, and as you know that that then becomes contrasted against raja yoga, which is just the 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 yoga of meditation, um, mm. generally speaking. Mm. I just want to backtrack a second and just ask you where the tantric element of yoga asana starts to come in and where you see that. I mean, you mentioned health reasons. Obviously, yoga, the original um, probably examples of asana were just holding one arm in the air or something, right? You know, if, if they weren't for meditation, they were just ascetic, just kind of trying to, you know, using tapas. Oh, yeah, and then tapas, at a tapas, certain yeah. point after the tapasya idea, the, 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 uh, the tantric stuff starts to come in, right? Using using a kind of almost like a kind of body hacking to and mm. and my and my qualification here is is it always involved with kundalini as well? Does the tantric aspect always intent on the raising of kundalini up? Yeah, yeah, they're they're, they're very good questions. I mean, I think there's definitely a paradigm shift with 
uh, Tantra. And so a lot of the physical practices that we get in the first millennium are, as you say, um, a, a sort of mortification of the body, either standing or sitting for long periods of time or even lying down. And there's even that element within Patanjali Yoga with the um, comments on uh, tapas and um, and how the body is to be viewed when talking about uh, yama and niyama. There's a there's a certain sense that the body is uh, unhelpful or you know um, obstruction mm. uh, a problem. Mm. Yeah. So that changes with tantra undoubtedly, and um, and I think also the understanding that. Uh, internal energies could be manipulated for the purpose of achieving liberation. And that, that's also very important. That's really what the early Ahata techniques are, are, are trying to do. They're trying to manipulate uh, prana, open up the central ch channel, sushumna, and bring about uh, samadhi and liberation um, uh, you know, by moving... Uh, kundalini, uh, prana, and agni, fire up through the central channel, clearing clearing any obstructions, the grunties, the knots, the knots, the uh, chakras. So you're always you're always relating, you always found related together tantra and kundalini in this. When you talk of tantra, it's, it's for the purpose of raising the kundalini. Is that right? And where does it? Well, secondly, I, where does it I, start to come in? And, it, and does it? I'm just mm. trying to get a word in. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. No. And, you know, no. It's fantastic. You're talking, but I'll say all my questions, then I won't disrupt you. Um, and then, because I've got you for an hour. And then, so, and then, where does it start to come in? Uh, people suggest, I think maybe you suggest that it, you know the tantra stuff creeps in from Buddhism. That it's it's an interpolation on on uh, Vedic thinking from Buddhism. Is that right? Or is there a homegrown idea? Well, in terms of. Hatha Yoga and what, what became Hatha Yoga, the, the earliest evidence that we have for the techniques is a Buddhist um, milu. It's a Vadrayana Buddhist tantric uh, milu. Mm. And there's also references to Hatha Yoga, even though it's not, they're not necessarily explained or uh, you know, described in any detail, in uh, Vadrayana Buddhist uh, texts that date from about the ninth, late 8th, Ninth century through to the eleventh century, so it seems that the Buddhists were using something called hatha yoga, usually as a practice of last resort when their normal tantric sadhana methods had failed. You know, if they were doing a mantra practice or a visualization practice, which was supposed to bring about the goals of uh, their tradition, usually liberation in some form. If that didn't work, then in, in a couple of instances, we get uh, this uh, idea that then they can practice Hatha Yoga uh, and, and it, might, uh, it, it might work. It might sort of work where nothing else had worked. Um, but, you know, Kundalini is very much a Shaiva um, uh, phenomenon. It, it, it's, it, it's coming from earlier Shaiva traditions and the earliest texts that we that we have that actually teach a yoga called Hatha Yoga that, that leads to Raja Yoga are Shaiva texts. It's the Amaralga, the Yoga Bija, the Yoga Taravali, um, uh, and, and so forth. They're, they're Shaiva texts that are using the, these techniques of Bandhas, Mudras, and Kumbhakas to um to achieve raja yoga and kundalini is always well in the in those instances these early shaiva traditions seems to be part of it and and the idea is that she's asleep at the base of the central channel and her mouth is covering the opening to the sh central cha channel and it's through the practice of uh hatha that the yogi can wake her up rouse her from a, her sleep make her straight like a stick and then start to move her up through the central channel with prana, where uh, the, the the you know the central channel is cleared, and it's when she reaches the head that samadhi raja yoga usually ensues, and that so that takes the practitioner of, you know from hatha through to raja yoga, and it's it's uh, it's by the practice of raja yoga that liberation uh, is achieved. So the texts are very good at giving us the structure of the practice. They may may not always give us the details. If you have specific questions about Kundalini, like uh, you know what happens when she you know reaches the head, does she unite with Shiva, or um, does she uh, dissolve into the void, or, or what happens? It may not ne necessarily answer such detailed questions, uh, 
But they give us the structure and it seems to be through that mechanism that the yogi goes from Hatha to Raja and Raja is the goal of Hatha and that's why we get the verse in the Hatha Pradipika and the Shiva Samhita that, you know, without Raja Yoga there is no Hatha Yoga and without um, Hatha Yoga, Raja, Raja Yoga cannot uh, be achieved because they sort of by that stage had reached a sort of a, a relationship of interdependence. One sort of needed the other and that wasn't always the case. For instance, in the Amaralga, it seems that the four types of yoga are based on the type of student. So if you are a very capable student, you just go straight to Raja Yoga and bypass Hatha. If you're a bit of a dull student, then you'd be given Mantra Yoga. That's pretty much what the, what the um, one portion of the text says. Uh, in the Yoga Bija, the, the, that relationship is redefined so that everyone starts with Mantra and then they move to Hatha and then Hatha results in Laya and then Laya Yoga results in Raja Yoga. It's sort of like a progression. And then in the Hatha Pradipika, it becomes a two-fold, a sort of a two-system relationship where there's just Hatha and Raja, Mantra and Laya Yoga have been dropped uh, altogether. And everybody practices Hatha Yoga to achieve Raja Yoga. And there's sort of no bypassing the Hatha, Hatha practice. So what, so what happened then? When did, what, what happened to Raja Yoga? It seems like we've, just been, we've been left a bit high and dry. I mean, I know you're probably, probably less of a scholar on mon, modern stuff, aren't you, I, I guess. But where did it, how did it unfold after the Pradipika to gradually get to this state where we don't hear of Raja so much now? I suppose. Yeah, that that that's interesting. I mean, I think with because uh, this so this is going in very much into the modern uh, yeah. history, and I th I think with the revival of asanas in the early twentieth century by Swami Shivananda, Krishnamacharya, mm. and uh, and others, the emphasis was very much on the physical practice and you know establishing a s collection or a repertoire of postures and how those postures might relate to say pranayama and the bandhas and so forth um, but not so much meditation that's that's the interesting thing whereas of course in the medieval period they were very much connected to raja yoga i do think perhaps around the 18th and 19th century the idea of raja yoga itself starts to become very broad because the term can basically mean the best yoga, yeah. the king yoga. Kingly yoga, king of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, king of all yogas. So you can have dozens of yogas out there and they might all have their particular names and specific techniques, but the, te the, but the yoga that's supposed to sit on top of them, that's the king of all of them, is Raja Yoga. So when you get lists uh, or, or collections of yogas, it's usually Raja Yoga is, is, is the best of, uh, or, or the goal of all the other yogas. So what tends to happen in the 18th and uh, 19th century is that whoever's teaching yoga decides that, that's, that, that they'll use the name Raja Yoga because they believe it's the best yoga, even if it doesn't really involve samadhi very much. So we have, a, uh, we have some Raja Yoga texts written in the you know, 18th century that are more to do with visualization and mantra practice, and there's very little, very little about samadhi, but this, they nonetheless call, call their yoga Raja Yoga. We sort of see the way the term gets used for Patanjali Yoga, Vivekananda and some of the theosophists at the end of the 19th century decide that Patanjali's yoga is the best yoga, which for them it was, that was their sincere belief, I'm sure, and so they start to call it Raja Yoga because they know the connotations of, Raj, of the term Raja Yoga. It's, it's, it's what you call the best yoga. So yes, if you're, it's just a sales pitch. That's right. Yeah. If you're going to go out there and yeah. teach yes. your yoga and you believe it's the most effective, powerful yoga there, out there, you can call it Raja Yoga and, and justify it in lots of different ways. Uh, so that's pretty much what Vivekananda did. And and, and, and it took off. It became a very popular idea in India. And that's where also the idea that Raja Yoga, going back to the um, you know, early Hatha and Raja Yoga texts, is connected with Samadhi. And of course, Patanjali's Yoga is all about the uh, attainment of Samadhi, the practice of Samadhi. That's why I think it worked very well, that association between Raja Yoga and um, Patanjali Yoga within India, because everybody 
realized probably that there was a longer associ- a long association between samadhi and raj yoga and of course patanjali's yoga became popular in the 20th century it became a sort of one of the um scriptural authorities on yoga that vivekananda and others used krishna macharya and so forth and so everyone accepted yes that's raja yoga it's 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 a, it's a text on samadhi and um, and then that got transmitted to the West. Just as an, a, as an adjunct. Are there other texts that are of equal quality and kind of clarity as the potentially Yoga Shastra or Yoga Sutras around? Or is it just that this one text is the text to look at if we're looking at, you know, a, a broad kind of scope of yoga practices? Or yeah, has it been? Well, I think that's the key, broad scope of yoga practices. Mm. I think that's why it's been a very useful text mm. in the mm. 20th century for various gurus to transmit their teachings because it covers all the bases if you mm. like it has this ashtanga system a lot of them wanted to teach yama and niyama so that's that's there in a very basic way and you know they, they mm, have five mm. yamas five niyamas and they can teach that and it, it also has a strong emphasis on the mind and um um, you know the obstacles and um, and how you can practice. You've got this uh, this kriya system or this ashtanga system that you can structure a yoga pra- practice around. And I think that's why it's proven to be a a, um, a very useful conduit, if you like, for um, gurus in the nineteenth and early twentieth century to sort of say this is what yoga is. This is this is um, uh, everything that you need to know about yoga it's a sort of a it's a framework a very um well designed f- framework that people can sort of use to hang their 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 ideas and teachings of, mm. of yoga mm-hmm. i suppose what i'm learning here is everyone has their kind of objectives with it right and and it can be slanted different ways it's not just like okay i've got the pradipika or i've got the sutras kind of like job done right like it's like well mm. you know but what version have you got, and 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 what what commentary have you got, and you know, I mean, there's kind of a lot more to it. I mean, to that end, I was just going to ask you more practically speaking. If people and people often say, well, what I want to read a text that's going to give me the classical kind of more classical iterations of what yoga is. Like, you know, do we find that in the uh, the, what can we draw from the uh, Swatmarama's uh, Pradipika uh, in terms of kind of information for for an asana practitioner is, is there anything that struck you as particularly relevant for for you know the everyday practitioner yeah i think there are but it's not uh, apparent as we were saying just before the podcast it's a, it's a text that i think a lot of beginners pick up and they're disappointed by uh, hmm. by reading a translation of it they, they sort of think you know what 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 was that all about or what hmm. was important about that hmm. it's, it, it, a lot of it's cryptic you know and it's using uh, um, uh, uh, you know, terminology about um, Raja Yoga or Kundalini and so forth, which doesn't necessarily resonate with the modern practitioner who, of course, has a more scientific uh, notion of the body, anatomy, physiology. So when you read the asanas, there's absolutely or, or very, very basic anatomical information just basically where the where the, f- the legs and, uh, and and the arms might might be placed but there's nothing no particular insight uh from that perspective nothing about the f- physiology the nervous system or um it's also a text unlike the patanjala yoga uh shastra it's also a text that's it's very much like a practice manual uh it it, it doesn't and it doesn't have much to to do with um, say psychological insight into the practice, whereas I think people get more from uh, the Yoga Sutras, particularly if the Yoga Sutras has been um, translated and uh, explained by uh, by a, a guru, a modern modern practitioner, because they can take all of their own experience, particularly in the the asanas or the or the meditation, and and use the sutras, these very pithy statements to to sort of um to prompt they're, they're sort of like the sutras become like headings for their own uh, explanation of, of of yoga and the experiences that they've had uh from it whereas the hatha pradipika doesn't really even do that the verses um are not so pithy uh, you know they're, they're relatively terse but they're not they don't they're not general enough 
to provide to, to act as hooks for a guru to necessarily expound upon a subject. They, they, yes, and and perhaps that's why they, even though the Hatha Pradipika has been translated dozens of times, and there are many printed editions of it, and it's usually referred to as the text on Hatha. I don't think it's played as significant a role in the twentieth century as the Yoga Sutras because it's not as accessible and um, and it doesn't sort of help gurus necessarily to ex- to talk about what they want to talk about, Mm-mm. if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's not a hook. Um, but what I mean, if, for example, why did, why did the, do you know why he picked those certain postures in the first place in, in the, the Pratipika? Yeah, yeah. Well, no. see, this, this is why I think the text is very, I mean, for me, the, the, the Hatha Pradipika is, is, well, if, if you were to ask which yoga text I'd take on to... Uh, you know, a, a deserted island. That. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 That's a good <laughs> question. Yeah. I'll ask that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll end that. The Hatha Pradipika. Yeah. Oh, really? I mean, I, th- I think the Hatha Pradipika is, uh, is, is, is um, a fantastic um, uh, creation. It's it just, just so clever on, on many different levels. Um, right. And um, basically we can start to appreciate that when we look at the literature that was written before it and the sort of the types of, yoga systems that were in place and how Svatmarama took those, sort of brought the, the best features of many of them uh, together to create a very sort of um, uh, um, a very broad but um, cohesive uh, s- structure of Hatha and Raja Yoga. Um, and he, he – and his work was a success. I mean, it really set set the, the you know the the scene for what Hatha and Raja was for the next three four hundred years. And usually, in the compendiums and texts that we have that were composed after the Hatha Pradipika, it's it's the format of the Hatha Pradipika that's the starting point for them. They might add more material and and redefine a few things, but but it's generally the the, the general structure of the Hatha Pradipika is 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 in place. So the insights that I see around asana in the first chapter, firstly, you know, the verses on diet are attached to the, um, to, to, to the section on asana. So I think that's basically saying that uh, diet, food, is very important for the, for the practice of uh, posture, as it is nonetheless also for the practice of pranayama and uh, mudra and uh, raja yoga. Um, although it's interesting that the general medieval position was that in the beginning – uh, food is very important, but then once your practice is established, it's not so important. Um, that that's also said. Um, with the asanas, of course, he's giving us, I think, just what were considered to be the most important postures. Not necessarily any intermediary po- postures or beginning postures uh, or any variations. He's just sort of giving us uh, w- what he thought were uh, fifteen very important postures. Eight of them are seated postures uh, that, that you would use for pranayama or mudras, such as Kirtari mudra. Uh, and the others are these are these more complex um, uh, asanas. Um, there's no, no mention, though, of sequencing. So often it's what's not mentioned that's also interesting. There's no mention of sequencing. There's no mention of how long the postures are mm. held for. Mm. Um, there's, there's no mention of the breath. Like whether you go into a posture with exhaling and then come out of the posture inhaling or anything like that, and I think the reason for that is that there was probably no consensus around those issues, and gurus really needed the freedom to be able to teach uh, teach different strategies, perhaps to different students. That, in other words, there were, it was very difficult to generalize on those on those issues. So, what we often see in yoga texts are the bare bones of a system. The, the, the sort of um, the necessary components, the, 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 the elements that no one can really disagree with. And then there's usually a lot of ambiguity around that where they might say, you know, you've got to go off and, and learn that from the guru. As we see, for instance, with Viparita Karani in the Hatha Pradipika, it says this should be learnt from the oral teachings of a guru. Um, and that suggests to me that, that, that there was a lot of variation in what was being taught, in the way gurus were teaching it. And the text didn't want to get in the way of that too much, otherwise it wouldn't be useful um, to, 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 uh, to people. 
and, and, and if the tech, you know, these, these are texts that are either memorized or written by hand on a, a, a you know, either on paper or palm leaf. You want your text to be useful when so much effort has gone into creating it and, and, and trying to disseminate it by getting people to memorize it and so forth. Um, what we do start to see after the Hatha Pradipika are more encyclopedic uh, texts being written that add a lot more information. So we do, we can start to fill in some of those gaps when we read a corpus instead of just one text. And that to me, perhaps because I've been able to do that both with the early texts and the more recent ones, again brings the Hatha Pradipika alive because I can sort of see some of the things that have been uh, excluded, but the but I can sort of also see the importance of what has been included and how mm. it sort of created uh, such a clean framework and structure and, 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 and included the most essential teachings. Um, the texts that tend to add more material tend to be more scholarly works that are written for a more learned audience. So, the, you know, the Hatha Pradipika was for a wide audience that probably wasn't necessarily... Um, uh, you know, consisting of people with very good Sanskrit who could say read the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, which is actually quite a quite a scholarly work. It's written more for the for for someone who had a basic type of Sanskrit um, and uh, you know and didn't need didn't you know could sort of get by reading simple verses. Um, so its aim is much more lay practitioner than Patanjali's. Text, which is cl clearly much for more monastic practitioners who've kind of decided to abandon the world, really, right, and devote themselves, celibate, you know, to celibacy and possessionless. And well, I would say more learned practitioners because you know, educated Brahmins could read the Patanjali Yoga Shastra mm -hmm. if they, you know, they would have very good the Brahmanical basic Brahmanical training, which was for Brahmin householders, was uh, you know, they grew up. Learning the Vedas and uh, Sanskrit and Panini and the you know the great uh, uh, works of Sanskrit, mm. so they could mm. pick up, I'm sure, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, and with the help from from a guru who knew the technical language and so forth, they'd, they'd be able to read it. But of course, with the Hatha Pradipika, I think it was going beyond that audience, beyond people who you know you know um, who didn't necessarily have that um, Brahmanical learning, um, but but nonetheless knew some Sanskrit. What about the Shatkamas? Do we find that precedent in previous times or are they introduced there and then? And, and, and people often ask how important the Shatkamas, whether the Shatkamas have always come with yoga or whether they, because I mean, you also, I mean, just to kind of try and cover all bases briefly with you, you also done a lot of uh, scholarly work on Ayurvedic texts, right? I mean, the, there's a principal Ayurvedic text that I always bloody forget the name of. Um, I read something that you've done on um, the, uh, I can't remember what it's called now. Put me out of my misery, but um, the the foremost yoga and medicine, yes, yoga and medicine yes, was, was one. Um, yeah, but, uh, I mean, do we start to see the, the shat karmas developed in in this kind of area, or, or you know, are, are there pre mm. in the yoga bija or other texts you mentioned? Um, so the earliest uh, um, instance we have of the shat karmas is the hatha pradipika. Okay. Um, now the fact that the hatha pradipika is an anthology opens a possibility that it was borrowed from an earlier text that we no longer have a record of, that, that no longer survives. That, that possibility is there. Though it's also possible that Svatmarama introduced them. You know, he knew about these techniques. They were being practiced by some. He thought they were very valuable, and so he decided to make it a main, a, you know, a sort of a, uh, a significant feature of um, Hatha Yoga. And he could have been the first person to do that. We don't. We don't know. We know that some of the techniques that he used were coming from other types of yoga that were not hatha yoga, and he sort of brought them in to hatha, and then after that, they're considered to be hatha yoga. So that could have been part of the case with the shat karma. The question I ask in my article on yoga and medicine is whether they're inspired by Ayurvedic mm. um, techniques, because you know Ayurveda uses enemas. Um, mm, mm, um, oil massage, a lot of similar mm. sort of techniques. But I, I come to the conclusion that, that there's no real connection between the two, basically because the shat karma uh, seem to be conceived um, for yoga practitioners, um, whereas with Ayurveda, the techniques, the, the, the medicines and the therapies that are, that are used are really for a doctor to apply to a patient. So with 
The Shat Karma, these are things that a yogi learns and then he applies to himself, him or herself. Yeah, yeah. So there's no real um, doctor-patient relationship with the Shat Karma. And actually, they require a lot of body control. So the type of doughty that's taught in the Hatha Pradipika requires that the yogi be able to move apana up into the throat so that um, so that uh, um, you know it can move the cloth out uh, without gagging and, and and so forth it requires a lot of body control which which of course would require training mm, so mm, I don't think that's exactly. practical in a medical context you can't sort of have a patient who's who's unwell come into the um, you know into the surgery and then you say right I'm going to start teaching you these yoga techniques and in six months time they'll actually be really effective Usually, doc, you know, in Ayurveda, you see medicines, herbs, um, treatments that can be applied there and then on the patient, and they and they have a have a, a healing effect. So that's one of the main differences between the two. And there's also a lot of details are different, such as basti is usually always done with water. Mm, mm. Again, it requires a lot of body control. The yogi is supposed to eventually have um, a sort of a conscious control over the sphincter muscles to allow the water to come in and out. You also need to create an inner vacuum to suck the water up into the body. Um, and, of course, the enema that's used in Ayurveda is done usually with an implement, and it usually always involves some type of medication in the, in the water or, or in an oil. It's not just plain, a plain water type of enema in Ayurveda, from from what I've gathered, uh, so there's details that uh, to me are significant enough to suggest that the Shat Karma were probably developed by yogis for yoga practitioners. Mm -hmm. uh, and even though they, there were general notions of medicine floating around, and you see this, uh, you know, in tantra in uh, Brahmanical texts and so forth, um, they had basic notions of disease. We see those in yoga texts, but it doesn't have the detail and the sort of complex theory behind it that we see in Ayurvedic traditions. So again, that's, that to me suggests that yogis were um, probably more inspired by um, uh, healing techniques that yoga practitioners had developed rather than going off to Vaidyas to, you know, to, to, to sort of develop healing techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, certainly if you read like the Shat Karmas in Theos Bernard or something like that, you kind of think, well, this is not something a sick person would be, you know, or any person exactly would be, uh, would find easy to do, right? I mean, they're, they're very involved. And I mean, I, w I was thinking though that you, you do mention Ashtanga coming from, uh, there's there's a mention of Ashtanga in the Ayurveda um, terminology, right? That this Asht idea of Ashtanga wasn't formulated by Patanjali. Um, so there must be some kind of interrelation or interpolation between I old Ayurvedic texts and this gradual, uh, you know, uh, weaving into, say, where we get to um, Swatmarama. I think th th there is a relationship between the two, undoubtedly, and there would have been Vaidyas that uh, had a knowledge of yoga and yogis that had some knowledge of Ayurveda. But I think what we can what we can state is that that the proponents of those traditions, when it came to writing the Shastra and deciding what was really fundamental to their traditions of knowledge, uh, didn't consider in the case of Ayurveda that yoga was particularly fundamental, and in the case of yoga, they didn't consider Ayurveda to be fundamental. That basically, um, uh, in yoga, it's the practice of yoga, and I would say the fundamental thing is really samadhi, the the attaining of samadhi for 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 um, the uh, um, achievement of liberation. And in Ayurveda, it was techniques, you know, it was medicines, herbs in particular, um, and therapeutic techniques that a doctor could apply to a patient. That, that, that to me seems, seems to be fundamental. Even, and we do get some references. So in, Char in the Charaka Samhita, there's a chapter on yoga. That was it's a one. very sort of old, yeah. old form of yoga that predates mm -hmm. uh, Patanjali, and it has this eight uh, auxiliaries. That's what I was talking it, about. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was a very Buddhist, very mm -hmm. Buddhist mm -hmm. type of yoga. Mm -hmm. So there, there. But nonetheless, when you read the, re I mean, that's a huge text, the Charaka Samhita. When you read the um, the aims of the practice and the general overview. Uh, Yoga doesn't really figure to any great extent um, outside that chapter. In I mean, 
Um, yes, but nonetheless, they were aware. They certainly didn't exist in uh, in airtight uh, um, chambers. Uh, um, but n- yes, I would say the relationship today, though, seems to be a lot um, closer, more cohesive. You know, absolutely, that- yoga uses therapy so much. Um, yeah, it, in the twentieth century, mm. and and in the you know on the on the Ayurvedic side, the 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 degree or the sort of system of learning in India integrates yoga for, for, for doctors. They, they basically have to spend, I think, at least six months learning about uh, yoga techniques. So if you go to any Vaidya, any Ayurvedic doctor in India today, he'll know some asanas and uh, the basics of yoga. And that's because the national curriculum um, in, integrates yoga. Finally, I wanted to ask him, in all this talk about identifying the authentic text, the original kind of uh, reference points of, say, a Swatmarama or a Patanjali, and how important, it, how important is the individual in this? Because as you mentioned yourself, I mean, there's people that wrote stuff in the margins, there's people saying this or that, and that stuff might be relevant. So do we need the, you know, the persons, what they said about it? How, you know, you see what I mean? Like, how important mm. is it to know exactly what Swatmarama says as opposed to the evolution 50 years later when someone came up with some really, oh, let's add that or, you know, let's mm. do you see what I mean. Like, you know, right? Like, like if it's always yeah, been I, evolution, where's the line in the sand when you go, this guy's a genius and I'm going to look at, you know, I'm going to follow his stuff because I kind of trust mm. Swatmarama, whereas I don't trust this guy over here who penciled a few notes while having a little coffee somewhere, but he might have been really yeah. good. Yeah. Well, I think in order to make that decision, you need to know both. Right. So, you know, part of our quest is to sort of try and, uh, figure out what Svatmarama might have been thinking because a lot of it's been lost, to be honest, with the different versions of the text floating around and the fact that we can't sort of call him up on the phone and ask him questions directly. A lot of the, that early um, formation of the text, uh, we're, we're just trying to piece together with, with various uh, um, c- you know, clues and inferences based on, on, on the current material. And then to sort of see the different versions of the text, how it changed, I think that really just provides people with um, with with more choices. Is that you know they, they can sort of see how things were added, um, how things may have been omitted, and then they they if they're dealing with the text, they can sort of make decisions about whether that was important or not, whether that's something that they need to take into account. As I say, when you're just dealing with a text that's printed and you think that's the text, it's a fixed thing, uh, then you, you, you really can't see beyond it. You can't or, or can't see through it or underneath it. And that's also another good reason for being aware of the other yoga texts that were written, the texts that Svatmarama used, because in some cases they were saying something very different to what he said. In the case of the, the text I did for my doctoral research, the Amanaskar, that text is saying that Hatha Yoga is not necessary. It's a waste of time. It's unnecessary exertion. It just, you know, pranayama brings about uh, a lot of pain and suffering. Forget about it. Just practice Shambhavi Mudra. You can achieve Raja Yoga that way and, uh, and, and job's done. So that's interesting. And you, you sort of see the way teachings are reinterpreted. For instance, this idea that the mind and the breath are in, uh, interdependent, that if one is active, the other is active. If one stops, the other stops. Well, that in the Amanaskar is used as a reason for not needing to practice pranayama, because if you can stop the mind through a, a technique such as Shambhavi Mudra, then the breath will automatically stop. So you don't need to do any deliberate retentions. Svatmarama takes those verses on the interdependence of the mind and breath and formulates the very opposite argument. It says, well, if the mind and the breath are interconnected, then focus on doing deliberate retentions to stop the breath, and then the mind will stop. And this is, of course, the justification for the practice of pranayama. You can sort of start to see these debates that that have been um, happening over the centuries by reading a broader corpus. And of course, we see these debates happening today. You'll see systems of Raja Yoga in India today that are, that are focused just on meditation. You don't need to do any complex asanas. And you'll see, such as in Vivekananda's book, uh, Raja Yoga, he'll say, you know, this Hatha Yoga is just uh, mm, physical yeah, exertion. Yeah, it's just, a, yeah. just about the body. <laughs> yeah. So these debates have been going on for a long time. When you look through the history, it's, you can start to start to see them and start to um, to get a better idea at what was at stake, what why particular traditions are arguing a particular position. And that, I think, helps people to navigate the uh, 
you know, the, the, the great number of yogas that are available today, the, the, the different uh, traditions that are teaching it and uh, the way it's being reinterpreted uh, worldwide in um, uh, so many different mm-hmm. ways. Well, I mean, lastly, what advice would you give then for some, because you're talking about a lot of intertextual comparison. I mean, what, what do you do if you haven't got the scholarly background to get a little bit of a context on, you know? Well, Hoping, I'm hoping that our publications right. will help people, and and also you know just um, uh, talking to you and uh, um, yeah. writing mm-hmm. um, articles, also teaching on trainings. We're we're all fairly active uh, trying yeah. to sort of teach the history of of, of yoga on that level uh, to sort of because the, you know there's two thousand years of yoga's history that 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 brings a tremendous richness. To the tradition that there, that there's, that's often not the case with other um, disciplines like, uh, um, you know, necessarily Pilates and and, mm. and other traditions. And I think that that makes uh, yoga um, uh, a richer experience for many people. It can, it can cause confusion in some cases yeah. uh, because there's multiple yogas yeah. and uh, multiple interpretations. And- but in case, but often an education in 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 the history and uh, and theory of yoga helps people to navigate those challenges, which are there anyway. Because you, anyone who goes to India today, can learn very different types of yoga and will hear contradictory statements about about yoga, about what it can do and what it's what it, what it can achieve. So an idea of the history uh, can help people mm. um, understand. The, yeah, uh, the contradiction. Yeah, and, to navigate their own methods and, and then their, their, and their mm. aims as well. Mm. You know? um, well, it's been a wonderful chat, Jason. Thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, how can people find the project? I suppose it's, uh, you've got a website for it. Um, yeah. Not yet, but no, not yet. Okay, soon. right. <laughs> Coming up. Watch <laughs> out. We'll put, we'll put any notes in the, uh, in the footnotes here. All right. Okay. Well, thanks, Jason, for your time. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much.